Specialists agree that the best approach to care for people with diabetes is a multidisciplinary one, where teams of healthcare professionals are working together, sharing information internally, and following up with patients in a structured and coordinated way. Is multidisciplinary diabetes care a response that can be delivered in Africa? The answer is yes. And with us are representatives from two institutions that have designed the structure and found the resources to deliver multidisciplinary diabetes care centers. Today, we will be speaking successively with a team of the Diabetes Care Center at Mpisha Hospital in Kenya and with the Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology in South Africa. To introduce our first case study for discussion, I will leave the screen to Dr. Tosif Dean, the CEO of Mpisha Hospital in Kenya. Multidisciplinary care in diabetes management is a very interesting topic for my hospital, Mpisha Hospital, to discuss. And being one of the oldest hospitals in Nairobi, Kenya, we were founded in early 1930s. And we are committed to provide quality health care at affordable rates. We are a 210-bed hospital with a workforce of close to 1,000 staff. And the focus has and always remains patient-centered care driven by our values. The vision for our hospital has been one-stop healthcare provider in East and Central Africa. And this resonates well with the topic because the diabetes care center that we have is one of our showstoppers in the hospital. And diabetes has been and remains our top concern and certainly now in the COVID-19 era is one of the most significant comorbidity that predisposes us to serious, serious COVID disease. And this is the vision of, of this center to be able to provide a one-stop shop approach. And with this vision, we have dedicated it entirely to diabetes and it was inaugurated in 2017. And uh, it's a joint project with the Lions International and has been formulated with immense support from the board of Mpisha Hospital and the entire management and workforce of the hospital. Why do we call it multidisciplinary? We feel that patients were being shuffled around between private doctor's offices, and this was causing delay in patient care management. And that is the reason why we decided to put everything under one roof. So you can access a diabetologist, a cardiologist, a counselor, an ophthalmologist, et cetera, with qualified nurses within one area. And the model that we have used is an affordable patient care model with introduction of various packages. And the packages allow patients to do a lot of financial planning and the packages include a consultation, uh, various blood tests, et cetera. And that way the patient can manage themselves financially. The current retention rate of a diabetes care center is about 70%. And one of the core strengths of our diabetes care center is a team that is dedicated and fully enjoys uh, working in this center and providing end-to-end -end patient care. Besides uh, consultation, we also have a laboratory within um, the setup and also a pharmacy that is available within the center. We have so far received great patient outcomes since 2017, and we continue with our training and education programs, which I feel is one of the top areas of concentration in diabetes. As we all know that diabetes, many things keep changing, and it is very important for us to remain abreast of what is actually happening. We do have future plans to be able to replicate this model into our satellite clinics. We have two satellite centers. One is at the, um, at a very busy mall. It's called the Village Market Mall. And the second one is uh, in the Central Business District. So we're planning to expand um, the centers into these areas, depending on uh, you know, the resources, because these are limited in this part of the world. So we're going to train resources to be able to expand into this center. And once we have additional resources, we will definitely expand into the various centers. So uh, Arv, uh, what were the key elements required to make the clinic a reality? Um, now, one of the things before you start uh, looking at a center of this scale is um, you need to have a very clear objective uh, in terms of the clinical purpose of the center. You need to, deter to determine its design element. For example, do you want it to be a multidisciplinary center, all comprehensive? Uh, do you want to bring in certain elements of it? Because that will determine the kind of space that you would require um, it to implement such a center. 
space is quite big because uh, in a subspeciality clinic, you need to make sure that you have catered for um, your objective. For example, with the MP Shah Hospital Diabetes Clinic, uh, we were given ample space uh, to implement a multidisciplinary center where we had uh, space for the reception, a triage room, consultancy rooms, numerous consultancy rooms. We had a counseling room, a diabetes education room, a nutrition room, uh, a phlebotomy room, an examination and treatment room. So you need to be very clear on your objective right from the beginning in terms of what uh, purpose your clinic is going to serve. Secondly, staff. Um, some of the institutions may have already experienced staff in terms of um, having dealt with diabetic patients as inpatients as well as outpatients. And um, if having that experience already within the facility will also help uh, engage the right caliber of staff to uh, help manage these patients within a subspeciality clinic. Um, obviously, you would need to um, look at um, you know any gaps in recruitment that you may have to fulfill such an objective as a multidisciplinary clinic. And um, later on, I will expand on you know what recruitment strategies we did implement uh, to make sure that uh, the center you know uh, had the multidisciplinary approach. The other thing you need to consider is um, the equipment. So when we're talking about equipment, we're talking about medical and non-medical equipment. So the non-medical being how you're going to renovate the center because as patients come in, they're expecting something extravagant in terms of a subspeciality clinic, something that puts it apart from the other clinics within the institution. So there may be some renovation element that you may need to consider in terms of the look and feel of the clinic to give it an factor, and um, you'll also need to look at the medical element um, you know in terms of sourcing certain uh, machines that you may need like the ECG the vital science monitor you might need to also uh, source an ABI if you're going to have a podiatry uh, section within your clinic medication list um, if you intend to have a pharmacy you need to make sure that the medication list is all comprehensive of the different ailments um, a diabetic patient may suffer for example any kidney problems that they may have or hypertension most of the diabetic patients that we come across we know that 80 percent of them suffer you know from a cardio uh, disease so you need to make sure that your pharmacy is properly equipped with the right medications Marketing, you need your marketing team there with you from the beginning uh, because they not only help you with setting up the center in terms of the signages, the adverse the competitor analysis that you may want to um, engage, but you need to make sure that your pricing element um, is accurate in terms of the target market that you're looking to serve. Um, you want to make um, you know, healthcare affordable um, as well for the patients so that they come to your clinic and the overall branding and the look and feel of the clinic, they play a vital part and role in that. Patient literature is also important because as you develop the consultancy rooms, um, you're also you know, encouraged to form partnerships with the pharmaceutical companies. Some of our colleagues are on this call today uh, to support the clinic through patient engagement, but also to help train our healthcare professional staff say for example on diabetes education through the provision of conversational maps or even through um, patient engagement materials such as insulin techniques and taking them through insulin techniques. Packages as uh, Tosif mentioned in her talk they need to be accurate in terms of the laboratory packages any consultancy packages that you may want to introduce um, so that you know um, again it makes it a little bit more accessible for the general public to attend this clinic and make it af uh, affordable in terms of access to healthcare. We also developed guidelines because we wanted a unified approach, a standard approach so that we have good quality care for the patient. And that's administrated by every um, person that's involved as uh, part of the clinic from reception to the pharmacy, to the consultant. So everyone's basically singing off the same sheet. So everyone is um, know what, what the best practices are that they need to follow and we've taken those from, um, you know, internationally. Arv has gone through uh, a lot of details about the different elements that are important to make a multidisciplinary clinic work. Did you, did all of these elements that she's gone through and listed echo with the way that CDE uh, has implemented its centre? So I think what one of the things that has characterised the CDE team, both in Houghton, Johannesburg, and the eventual nearly 200 centers that we set up through, or over 200 at one stage, centers that we did set, set up throughout South Africa, 
is a, an extraordinary passion for diabetes care. We have really tried to get that across in all of our training events. Uh, Dr. Distiller is the founder of the CD network in South Africa um, over 25 years ago. And it was through his single-minded passion that he started a multidisciplinary center in Johannesburg. And he didn't need to. So let's make it quite clear that he was, from a financial point of view, doing quite okay as a diabetologist, keeping a ward of around 50 to 60 people per day coming in for diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia, commencing insulin. As an ethical and insightful and foresightful practitioner, he realized that there had to be a better way of doing things. And that was soon after the introduction of personal glucose monitoring for people with diabetes. And he said to himself that there must be a better way for the person with diabetes. It was quite easy for him because seven o'clock every morning, he'd walk into the hospital and he'd go past each bed. And it was almost, in his words, like a cash register. You'd pull the handle and they would spit out your, your consultation fee. But he realized that with the new technology that was available, that allowed community management that wasn't a sustainable model. It wasn't a, a, a right model to, to continue with. So he decided to set up a multidisciplinary team-based practice in Houghton, Johannesburg, or in, originally in Parktown, Johannesburg, and containing the services of doctors, diabetologists, and endocrinologists, diabetes nurse educators, bionicineticists, dietitians, podiatrists, the laboratory service, pharmacy, and so on. All the things that Av has talked about. Can you, can you explain the structure of CDE and uh, how the center uh, operates and how it is uh, su supported fi financially? So, so in, in essence, the, the very basic facts we need to know about CDE. We were really the first true managed care organization in South Africa. Um, there are many versions of what is called managed care, but really we were the first organization to take it to the nth degree. That meant we sought funding from medical funders, other people might know them as health insurers, um, to carve out a diabetes-related capitation fee per client that we serviced per month. And for that, we took all the risks of managing diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis. So that covered all the doctor's visits, dietitian, nurse educator, podiatrist, um, ophthalmologist, screening services, laboratory tests for sentinel management of sentinel blood, uh, blood tests and so on. Um, we also covered all the medications, whatever that was, including insulins, all the oral agents, ketone test strips for people with type 1 diabetes, glucagon to rescue people from hypoglycemia, and two very important things I think what set us apart was that we took risk for acute diabetes related emergencies like hypoglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. So if a person with diabetes under our care was admitted for any of those conditions, we paid for that out of the capitation fee. Uh, can you uh, explain from your own perspective how CDE got started in the very first instance? Was it all down to uh, sheer uh, goodwill or uh, working uh, through all the, the challenges? Can you really try and, and transport us back in time to 1994 when it all started for you? I'll, 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 I'll tell you the story. In 1994, in fact, by 1992, we became aware of the fact that we need a multidisciplinary center to treat diabetes properly. And over the next two years, we put together aspects of the center, we found staff members to come along, found a podiatrist, found a good pharmacist, found a, trained a nurse in those days, an educator. And in 1994, we built our first center and moved into this multidisciplinary center, very proud to be there. We found within a very short period of time, we were going to go insolvent because the, the funding people at that space, the medical aids, did not recognize education, so they wouldn't pay for it pay the pittance for part of podiatry and less than that for dietitians. We had to pay our staff and we couldn't earn enough to do it. The concept struck me that if you look at treating diabetes, and if you look at my hands here, it takes that much money to treat it out there. We were treating it 
for the funders for that much money. So we said to them, can we meet halfway? And rather you give us less than you're paying at the moment for our patients, more than we're earning at the moment, and let's let's go forward. And my concept then was take diabetes, you guys don't know what you're doing with that, you, you funders, hand it over to us. In other words, carve diabetes out, the total carve out, give it to us for a fee per month, the capitation fee. We will take over diabetes, we look after the patients. And it took me about a year and a half to persuade, going door to door, banging on doors, some of the funders to try this out as a totally new concept because in those days, managed care was unknown in South Africa. It was going in America, they tried to introduce it in South Africa and it failed. So people weren't keen to get involved in it. We eventually got a few funders to get involved. We started in our center working on a basis that paid us so much per patient per month to take total care of the patient. Within about four months, they came back to us and said, this works very well, but you're only in Johannesburg. We've got patients all over the country. We need other people in the country to do the same for us. So I called together the then only eight endocrinologists in South Africa in those days. We met and I told them what we were doing and I asked if they would be interested and they said yes. We expanded to eight centers. A few months later, they contacted me again, the funders, and said, that's great, but your centers are only in the major metropolitan centers. We've got patients in the smaller towns as well. We want centers there. So then I approached GPs I knew around the country, people I trusted, and I said, I'll train you in teaching diabetes properly if you'll join the system, which they agreed to do. We spent 14 centers. And that worked for a while. But then we got, again, people saying to us, we need more centers. The country's too big for 14 centers. So I started approaching GPs around the country and signing them on and training them. That was the start of our training courses, 1996-97. We started with those as a two-day course. We then had further problems because in those first years, I was reported repeatedly to medical council for uh, stealing patients from people, for, for, for taking their patients away. And I was told by council, what you're doing, nothing wrong with it, but you can't be uh, descriptive. You've got to let any doctor who wants to join your program. So we went out there advertising and saying, guys, if you're interested in diabetes, if you want to, come along, we'll train you, you can open your own center. And we spread to about 160, 170 centers based on that where we are today. And these centers are all trained. They've got beta courses. Many of them have got diplomas in diabetes to University of, of South Wales. And uh, we're now running a, a very successful countrywide um, uh, network. Part of our network and part of what we insist on is that anybody who joins our network, their patients must have care with access to a trained educator, a dietitian trained in diabetes, uh, podiatry, uh, full care, op have the eye screen once a year, and we've got contracts with ophthalmologists to do this for us. So you've got a full multidisciplinary care. In our center, it's in one center, it's in one building. And that's the ideal way to go. And patients regard that as their diabetes medical home. And they pop in anytime they want to for a cup of coffee with the educator, say hello, pick up a prescription. Other centers around the country aren't that big, and many are just GP's offices where they employ a educator and use a dietitian down the road, the dietitian across the suburb. So uh, um, Larry has gone through the, the genesis of, of CD and, and how this all started. What about MP Shah? Uh, what happened uh, at the very beginning? Who decided to do what and how did you get involved in the project? I've been working in diabetes for the last uh, five years and my background has been pharmaceuticals. I moved over to Kenya back in 2014. Um, we were doing, we started off working uh, in diabetes uh, through doing a lot of medical camps, uh, a lot of diabetes awareness, and we did find um, a lot of people that were um, diabetic through the medical camps. And um, where we basically started uh, working with MPSHA is having seen our work that we had been doing. Uh, we had a preliminary meeting with uh, our chairman and vice chairman and the CEO um, at MPSHA Hospital where they uh, shared their vision of having a subspeciality clinic within MPSHA Hospital, a diabetes clinic. And I was tasked with um, coming up with a model in two weeks to present to the board and the management. And having done some research and worked within this uh, therapeutic area, uh, the, the model that we presented was a multidisciplinary one, an all-comprehensive model. Um, 
Let's touch on different elements. Um, after we did the presentation to the board and management and the model was approved, we had six weeks in which to uh, execute and implement it. So um, and we worked with the MP Shah project management team. They had assigned uh, various um, uh, special uh, special staff from different uh, departments to work with me on uh, developing the model and uh, during this time we basically looked at every element from renovation to recruitment to uh, sourcing equipment um, also how many rooms etc would be required um, we executed the model in um, six weeks uh, it went live but at the same time as working on the main hospital which we refer to as the hub at MP Shah because that's where the multidisciplinary team sit um, we also had our satellite at Lionside First Eye Hospital go live within a few days uh, with some of the services such as counseling, nutrition, podiatry, um, having an endo uh, consultation as well, uh, being uh, factored within that satellite clinic as well. So um, after we um, have the clinic go live, um, I was appointed as a project manager and a strategic consultant to continue the expansion and growth of the clinic. And um, as, as my role, I looked at recruitment of additional staff, also marketing campaigns, working very closely with the marketing team. We identified training needs of the staff and we also had um, sponsorship mm -hmm. from our pharmaceutical partners to uh, send some of our staff for CDE training in South Africa. And with strategies implemented, uh, we were cheering uh, weekly operations meetings, uh, which I was chairing with the head of departments that were the endocrinologists that had been put in um, their positions. Also, we provided uh, monthly updates to management in terms of the progress we were making with the clinic, any challenges that we were coming up with and how we were coming up with solutions to rectify those um, for the betterment of the clinic. Um, each year, um, now I've been working as a project manager and strategic consultant with MP Shah for the last three years, and each year we set our goals for the clinic. And um, we have mid-year reviews uh, with the management to keep the momentum up to meet our goals, uh, which is uh, increasing the patient foot flow into the clinic, but also introducing subspeciality clinics within the clinic. For example, an exercise clinic that runs once a week, podiatry clinic also runs once a week, and um, pediatric diabetes clinic runs once a week as well, uh, with our uh, nurses uh, supporting all those three clinics. We also encourage um, our nurses for continuous learning. So if they have any interest in a specific area, we uh, do look for opportunities for them to fulfill their um, dreams and desires to uh, further educate themselves. But we also work with marketing on new campaigns, new <coughs> promotions, medical camps, and um, also we've been running diabetes symposiums um, as, as a way of covering some of the topics that are uh, run by the Lions Diabetes Care Center on a yearly basis. So the annual and this year we'll be doing our fourth diabetes symposium. And um, we have different themes uh, each year that we come up with and work very closely with the team on. Uh, we also put corrective strategies and measures in place. Uh, we develop reports um, for the management metric reports so that they can see the progress on how the centers are up and coming. Uh, we were fortunate enough, as Atosif mentioned beginning of a talk, to launch uh, two additional satellites uh, last year based on the um, need um, that we had to fulfill. One was at uh, Village Market, which is a mall, and uh, the other one was at Dinsho Clinic, which is in uh, town, uh, in the main heart of the town of uh, Nairobi, uh, for cash paying um, clients as well. So depending on what the need is of the market, we have been able to slightly modify the model to accommodate that need. Uh, could could you uh, maybe before we go back to to CD explain uh, precisely the um, the financial structure and how you've managed to make this both uh, financially sustainable, but also you've been able to uh, offer a uh, a cost for uh, the the patients that is uh, reasonable. Maybe give us give us a bit of a context with the the diabetes care uh, in in Nairobi and uh, the, the cost that of, of for patients to take part in the uh, clinic's activities? 
Basically, when we started off with the clinic, it was funded by MP Shah Hospital um, and we utilized the existing uh, space that they actually had. But we had to do a lot of market research in terms of the cost of laboratory costs if you were to go get um, some of the tests done, like urine analysis or HbA1c, what was the charges that were being um, implemented within the market. Uh, secondly, we were also looking at consultancy rates. Uh, so if you, for example, if you were to see a private uh, endocrinologist, you are looking at anything between 5,000 to 6,000 shillings in Kenyan shillings. Um, if you were to go to uh, some of the other hospitals, they were charging consultancy at about 3,000 shillings. Uh, we wanted to keep uh, things subsidized for the patients. So, um, for example, at the MP Shah Clinic, our consultancy charges are 2,000 shillings to see an endocrinologist. However, if you do have um, a subspeciality um, to be seen, for example, a cardiologist or a nephrologist, um, the charges are 4,000 shillings um, due to the complications that may have uh, set in as a result of your diabetes. But we do give diabetes education free. So while a patient is waiting to be seen by the doctor at the clinic, um, they are being engaged in a, a diabetes education um, training session uh, free of charge. And those are run on a daily basis. So this kind of gives you a flavor of um, the kind of prices that we charge to keep it subsidized. Even the laboratory packages have been subsidized for the patients. Um, yet we're still able to uh, keep the momentum up in uh, the expansion and uh, cover uh, costs as well. So, CD, the model uh, for you guys is, is different because you've, as you've explained, you're working in a close uh, collaboration partnership uh, with uh, the medical aids, which are uh, for people who are not familiar, the uh, uh, health insurance system in South Africa. So, uh, but that means there, there are constant discussions to keep the, the model working and, and alive, uh, Larry. Yes, we have a problem with this because it's, it's all about money for the, for the funders. And um, in the early days, we said we need X amount to keep patients going well per month, and they paid us like new arguments. As time has gone by, and with a modern trend, there's more and more, they want data. They want to gather data on utilization. They want to prove that what we're doing for the patient is worth the money in terms of utilization. They don't look at outcomes. Our patients have less hospitalization, better HPA1Cs, less long-term complications, but their main vent is saying, how many times a year does the patient see you? How many times a year does he have a blood test done? And um, that's caused some friction between us, because a lot of our centers around the country provide beautiful, urgent care to the patients, excellent long-term care to the patients, doing very well. They're not prepared to sit down and start sharing data. So that's caused of one problem. The other problem has been with the increasing cost of medication and the newer drugs on the market over the last five years, particularly for type 2 diabetes, we're finding that um, these schemes are unkeen to pay that sort of money and they are more and more offering us alternative packages whereby they take back the medicines and they supply the medicines on their formularies and pay us for servicing. So the different packaging now available because the schemes are being very difficult about financial implications. We don't get funding from government. We don't get funding from NGOs. It's purely a private practice, uh, a private industry, funding from the private, which is the, the, the health medical aids. And we see many patients fee for service in our clinics with multidisciplinary care. But they aren't on our diabetes program because their schemes haven't elected to join the program or they aren't on any medical aids. And they are seeing fee for service. We find, however, that with fee-for-service, patients are less keen to see educators and dietitians because they don't want to pay for it. Whereas when they're on our diabetes program, it's all inclusive and they're happy to come and see the, the, the healthcare providers. What I didn't mention earlier, and I should have perhaps, the major component of our center in Johannesburg is our biokinetic center. We've had for 20 years a fully-fledged biokinetic center run by biokineticists who is an absolute expert in diabetes and exercise, both type 2 and high-risk patients, and type 1 and insulin adjustments. It helps us with our exercise programs. So there is a lack of, lack of understanding from the funders about uh, the way, the best way to, to treat diabetes and uh, the whole concept of multidisciplinary uh, care or, or prevention, all these concepts. And, and 
the way to treat diabetes is not understood well and it's the, the concept of uh, having a, a fee for service which seems uh, straightforward is actually for in terms of outcome not so good uh, f for the for the patients uh, they're not interested in outcomes they're interested in cost and we have this problem all the time it's constant battle with them if patients are doing better staying out of hospital better quality of life happier better longevity but they say it costs too much per month they don't look they don't, don't look at the big picture it's part of what we're fighting all the time they don't also understand the, the personal cost to the person with diabetes of the extra administration of having to pay and claim and our program took all that away so that a person can go and get care not have to pay for anything um, and it as Dr. De Silla says, it makes them much more willing to partake in all the services that they should be taking care, care of. Any new patient with diabetes coming to our centre first has an appointment with the educator before they get anywhere near a doctor. Correct. The educator then ascertains how much they know, where they're at, checks the HbA1c, their lipids, yeah. makes any necessary adjustments to therapy initially with the background of going to the doctor and presenting the case much like a a, a houseman, and um, the patient then booked to see the doctor a few weeks later. So when they see the doctor, the basic education of what is diabetes, what we're trying to achieve, is already being brought home to them. So the doctor doesn't waste his time doing that. He spends his time actually examining and treating the patient. And it took us a long time to get patients and our colleagues who refer us patients to understand that they first have to see an educator. But it's now become standard in our centre. I just want to go through some of the comments and questions that have been uh, raised in the in the chat. Uh, Kirsten is saying, as a patient, uh, as a type 1 patient, I was very excited to join the CDE program through my Discovery Medical Aid, but was disappointed to learn that the relationship fell through a couple of months in. And I think maybe that's a, as a reflection of the, the challenges of, of making these programs uh, work for uh, all parties. The study we were with us as clients for 18 years and decided last year that the whole program was just too expensive and took it back. And they've still got their diabetes program, still see their patients, but under a slightly different uh, way. They, what happens is that Discovery pay the doctors directly now, not through CDE. And they've taken out of their capitation fee to the doctors, pediatry and ophthalmology, which they pay for as fee for service. So we also have a few comments from people uh, saying how multidisciplinary team management is uh, really something that is important and the way to go. We've got Chidi and Bonani, uh, Betty, Evan Jenga, who's saying that she has also been involved in setting this type of clinic in, in other places uh, in Nairobi. And uh, a question from Robert Celepe that came uh, early on. I just wanted to throw it to you. Maybe Michael can... can uh, uh, tell us what he thinks about this. The question was, um, successful delivery of care services should take into account social determinants of health, especially in rural areas of our continent. Uh, w w what can you answer to uh, Robert? Robert, that is a huge and very pertinent question, and we could go on all night with that. Um, but essentially, diabetes, the etiology and causation and management of diabetes does not take place in a vacuum. Um, and I think this is where most diabetes uh, services come unstuck, is that they view the management of diabetes as a very technical thing. If you've got hyperglycemia, you give an agent that drops blood glucose. But it's a lot more complex than that. There are, particularly in Africa, there, there's a huge prevalence of poverty, which um, mitigates against people being able to afford the right kind of care. Uh, which is maybe not available through services that would normally be available to people who, who don't have money. There are also cultural expectations that we need to mesh into our care. For example, um, the South African NHANE in, in study showed us that 9 out of 10 South Africans view their ideal body image as fat. Now, that's an unbelievable statistic. But when you get to a condition like type 2 diabetes, where one of the primary modalities of therapy is to reduce excess adiposity, particularly around the, the, the abdominal area, your client is likely to not view that in a very positive light. Because for them, culturally, excess body size is viewed very positively. 
It means possibly that I don't have HIV, I don't have TB, I'm, I'm doing well financially, I've got a good wife, I've got a good husband, I'm healthy, I'm happy. And now you're taking away an external expression of all of those things that for them are positive. So we've got to be extremely aware of culture within how we do things. And the other thing that Dr. Distilla mentioned is that we don't, we have a lot of people who are not prepared to pay for educator, dietitian, and podiatry services. They're quite happy to see those people when it's part of a managed care program and they don't have to ostensibly pay anything up front for it. But as soon as they have to, then it shows the lack of value that, that most people have in preventative health care. Because we've got to understand that most of us are socialized from when we little boys and little girls, that when we're sick, we go and see a doctor. The corollary of that is that when you're not sick, you don't see a doctor. So our, our socialization is not towards preventative health. And so these are some of the social determinants of health that we've really got to look at. Um, and that, that extends all the way up to policymakers, whether we're talking about policymakers at the level of government or in medical funders, but they need to also understand that it's not just a question of cost, not just a question of what medicines are we going to fund or not fund and what consultations are we going to fund or not fund and how, and how much. So diabetes is complex. And I think if you don't understand that complexity uh, and view it as a technical issue, you, you are going to come short. Uh, absolutely. I agree with Michael. And um, how we basically manage this at the MP Shah Clinic is that as soon as um, they've been through triage and seen the endocrinologist, um, there is um, a requirement for them to be a nutritionist um to manage help manage their diet so what we do in the first consultation um with the endocrinologist is set the goals um for the diabetic patient in terms of what they want to achieve for example if they want to achieve weight loss to improve their um sugar readings if they want to improve their blood pressure uh, readings as well uh, what do you basically need to do so one thing for the patients is to accept accept that they actually have a condition that they need to improve um, that's the first step and that is through seeing a counselor seeing a nutritionist seeing a diabetes educator a lot of them uh, would not take on these opportunities if these uh, services did not coexist within the clinic because one thing you don't want is that a patient goes away and then has to come back to see a counselor nutritionist and a diabetes educator and um, it's vital for them to see these three individuals because it helps to prevent uh, any further complications that they may be heading towards um, and also if they are newly diagnosed uh, some of them are in denial so counseling is very important but there is a stigma around counseling because they think that it's a mental condition uh, this is why you need to have counseling and we need to change that perspective that it's not nothing to do with the mental uh, condition that you may have but counseling is important to accept your condition so that you work together with the team of the multidisciplinary team to better your health and to be to self-medicate to self-help and uh, also have self-knowledge in terms of your um, diabetes care the other thing we also do within the clinic is we encourage somebody uh, like the diabetic patient to come with a family member or a friend somebody uh, with them so that they can understand the condition they can get the support from the family one of the mistakes we made with my mother uh, who's also diabetic is none of us used to go for her consultations with her and it's only we started to take interest when the complications set in and we were wondering why the complications set in so from the beginning, we always encourage the patient to come with a family member so we can also explain this condition to them and that together with the support of the family, they can help meet their goals and achieve their goals that have been set for them. Um, depending on that, we have regular um, review meetings with them. So we do send reminders uh, via SMS messages to say you're now due for your you know, appointment. If um, the endocrinologist has set it at three months time frame, if they're uh, controlled, if they're not controlled, the appointments could be on a monthly basis but we do send those reminders to encourage them to come in and see the team listening to you uh it seems like any um center or uh, facility that wants to provide multidisciplinary diabetes care uh needs to think uh, about themselves as also an education center by definition it seems that it came naturally for cde but also for uh, MP Shah Clinic. Uh, what do you think uh, of, of this, Arv? 
I, I think it's important, yes. Um, my answer to that question will be yes, because I think education is important not only for the patient, but also for the healthcare professionals. We need to keep abreast of new processes, techniques uh, that are being introduced within the industry, um, you know, undertake the CDE training to keep abreast of, um, you know, uh, new processes that we can implement, uh, not in terms of just management, but also in terms of prevention. So um, I think it is important and that we have an element of education, um, you know, implemented as part of the clinic uh, for the patients as well as the healthcare professionals. Go further than that for us because we're running so many centres around the country. It's important that our doctors around the country are trained. And I've been accused of being very nasty to my colleagues who aren't trained. My comment to them is they can't spell diabetes, they shouldn't be treating it. And uh, we, we insist on our doctors being trained, which was the start of our courses that now go throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Our five-day courses are very well known, as you've heard already. Our forum every year is very well known. And we're now going online with a foundation course, which is a pre-five-day course to give basic training to doctors around the country, so and around, South, around Africa. Mm -hmm. So I think we're very keen on training them because if the doctor doesn't know what he's doing, then the educator, the counsellor, and the patient are lost. Because we have situations where the counsellors will give the patients a good advice. They go back to their doctors who say, say, they don't know what they're talking about, they're only a nurse. Listen to me. And the doctor doesn't know what an HBO1C is. So it's very important we get in from the top down and train our colleagues. Are, are you guys working also with a patient's organization uh, in any way to uh, spread knowledge? I'm saying this because uh, and, uh, we had also the comment uh, on, on the chat saying that uh, I've learned much of what I know about my diabetes healthcare through other diabetics on social media and their experience of the condition. And endocrinologists cannot hold my hand every step of the way. So um, do you also have uh, ex exchanges with patients' organizations? tried to work very closely with a number of uh, organizations that represent people with diabetes. And largely, it, it, it hasn't worked out the way we'd hoped. I mean, we offered free office space to the biggest organization at the time in South Africa, and eventually that was eschewed. do work quite closely with a youth organization called Youth with Diabetes, and we run camps, you know, in, in conjunction with them. But having said that, we whatever organization we offer them free attendance at our postgraduate forum each year. So yes, we, we work as much as we are able to. Social networking has changed the playing fields. Yeah. Our patients now claim that they need organizations. They communicate with colleagues and friends by social networking and learn all sorts of ideas, some good and some bad. That's what worries me. Yeah. Good stuff's good, bad stuff's bad, and they can't differentiate one from the other. That's my concern. Um, just to add to that, uh, we have been uh, trying to basically work with organizations in uh, Kenya to create diabetes awareness. And there are some NGOs that we have been talking to. Um, we, we were thinking of basically starting at the primary school level in terms of educating um, so that as the children grow up, they're aware of, um, you know, their lifestyle choices that they would make uh, to, you know, from a prevention strategy perspective. But other than that, we are running um, diabetes support groups within the uh, MP Shah Hospital as well as the satellites. So one month we do run one for a type 2 diabetic patient and the alternative months we run for type 1 diabetic patients. But it's something that definitely that we need to explore to see how we can create that awareness. I completely agree, agree with Dr. Distiller in terms of social media um, and the concerns that he has. I think we need to make sure that a lot of the information uh, doesn't get vetted through when it gets posted on social media. Um, so um, I think we need a unified approach in terms of how we uh, conduct patient education and awareness moving forward. Mm. It, and sorry, but you've also been behind uh, the, the launch of uh, and not uh, this type of uh, organization reaching out to patients online with diabetes are. That's correct, yes. And what we do with our um, material that is being posted is that it's vetted through our um, 
uh, healthcare professionals. So we have moderators that are um, either endocrinologists that look at the information before it gets posted to make sure that it is accurate. And we also have um, a podiatrist that is looking at the information when we post it about the foot. So we have different themes running uh, each week on the diabetes uh, patient support platforms, but they are vetted through. The information is vetted through by healthcare professionals before it gets posted. What are the uh, first three steps for someone wanting to create uh, such a team or such a facility uh, in their own region and countries? Uh, the first thing you need is a mess of fire in your belly. It's hard work, it's difficult, you've got to persuade whoever's doing the funding, their government, their private funders, of the advantages of multidisciplinary care, that it does cost. Treating diabetes is not cheap. It costs money to do it properly, that you pay to pay the money. That's your first step. You've got to have a fire in your belly. Secondly, you've got to have guts. It's hard work. And thirdly, you've got to have a team around you who have to feel the same way you do. That's your starting point. I think you need to have um, a very clear objective. I mean, I'm now sitting with a PM and strategic consultant hat on. Um, you need to have a very, very clear uh, objective in terms of what you want to achieve from your center. The same model that we have in Kenya may not be the same suitable model for yourself because your target audience and market may uh, be different. So you may need to do some sort of adaption um, to the model according to your needs. Secondly, you need to have passion and drive um, to make it work. As uh, Dr. Distiller said, it is hard work. It has been hard work and a hard climb, um, but there is fruits of the labor come through and you will see the success of your clinic if you keep at it. Thirdly, you need a team and unified approach. Uh, you need um, the right project team to work with you that has the same passion that you have uh, in terms of the objective that you're trying to achieve. Um, if it is providing affordable subsidized healthcare to diabetic patients, then that's your objective, that's what you need to work to. But you need to have that clearly defined right from the beginning. Uh, yeah, I think I would just like to take up on the multidisciplinary team. A multidisciplinary team is not a group of people of different professions working in one locality. And I think that, again, is approaching diabetes from a very technical point of view. What, what constitutes a team is, is a group of people who are specialized in their areas, but who work with each other. They meet regularly. They respect each other's viewpoints. And they're also happy to collaborate across the gray areas at the intersections of their varying specialities of practice. Um, and they must all be passionate for the diabetes care, as Larry said. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Michael, uh, Arv, and uh, Larry, for your participation. I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Tosif Dean for the uh, introductory words. Uh, it's been inspirational to uh, hear from you, and obviously we take this as a, a very first step towards uh, inspiring others. I am guessing that if anyone is interested to get in contact with you, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to pass on and you'll be happy to, to take their, uh, their information because uh, you said you've got the fire in the belly and uh, this is something that can hopefully be transmitted uh, to others. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you.